Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. John Bergsma. Uh, Dr. John Bergsma, I'm so excited to have you on my show. I actually have your book right here, uh, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I hope you can see it. I encourage everyone to go buy it and read it. And yeah, it's a great work. Uh, Dr. Bergsma, I'm just, I'm blown away by just the fact that you reached out, uh, that I, you know, I, I sent in my contact information and you were able to get back to me. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of stuff that you're doing with Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jewish roots of Catholicism, that's, you know, right up my alley. And um, in case anyone's wondering in the background why my bookshelf is kind of emptier than usual, I'm actually going back to Kansas City for a bit to just spend time with my family. And so a lot of my books are <laughs> off the shelves and in my car right now. So uh, anyway, Dr. Bergsma, thank you so much for coming on to my show. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, you know, I was really impressed with that article you sent me uh, from the Hate Trip Journal. And uh, you're doing some fantastic scholarship, um, you know, in terms of uh, biblical apologetics for the church and uh, just very, very impressive. So um, uh, it's a delight to be on the show with you. Thank you, Dr. Bergsma. All right, well, let's get started with just kind of, um, you know, on, on the docket I have as the first question, uh, just could you briefly introduce yourself to the audience and even your journey to Catholicism? Because as I understand it, you know, you weren't Catholic your whole life. You were actually once uh, a Protestant minister. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. So um, my uh, father was a U.S. Navy chaplain, and uh, I come from a uh, basically a clergy family, uh, two uncles who are also pastors, um, myself and my three brothers. We all went to the seminary for various uh, amounts of time. Uh, one of my brothers is still a pastor. My sister married a pastor. So uh, very much a, a, a clerical family in uh, the Dutch Calvinist movement. And um, so, you know, moving around in the U.S. military, since as I said, my, my dad was a, a Navy chaplain, um, uh, graduated from high school in, in Hawaii, then moved to West Michigan to the, our denominational school there and uh, did 10 years undergraduate, uh, two master's degrees at the seminary. Um, I served a church uh, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan for uh, about four years as an urban pastor, doing a lot of mission work and uh, fundamental catechesis, presentation of the gospel, uh, crisis counseling, all, all kinds of uh, jail ministry, these kinds of things. And um, then in uh, 99, I went uh, for a doctorate in Bible at the University of Notre Dame. And that's where I encountered really good examples of, of Catholicism being lived out uh, up, up close and personal for the first time in my life. And uh, they're just really wonderful um, uh, Catholic grad students at University of Notre Dame. I, I began friendships with a couple of them, one in particular and um, was really impressed by my Catholic friend's ability to uh, defend uh, the Catholic faith uh, from scripture. Um, also the devotion to scripture that I found in my friend, he carried a New Testament with him and would pull it out and quote it uh, to defend various Catholic teachings that I thought were unbiblical. And he was beating me at my own game. <laughs> Uh, so I felt like one of those martial artists that jumps in the ring with somebody who knows Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, and you know, you're maybe a third degree black belt in karate and you're getting your fanny uh, slammed on the mat by, by this other guy. And uh, so this Catholic was really uh, beating me at uh, biblical apologetics. And, uh, and then he got me to read the church fathers. And when I got into Ignatius of Antioch and saw how Catholic he was in particular, particularly from anyone who denied, or I, I should say, who refused to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up for our salvation. Mm -hmm. If you, that, that's, that, that's Ignatius of Antioch. That, that's virtually word for word from um, his letter to the Smyrnians uh, at the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7 of that letter. And that's being written about the year 106. Okay, so about 10 years after the, the commonly accepted date of the death of the Apostle John. So very, very, very early in, in church history. Got this explicit testimony 
Stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered and which was raised. Very, very clear testimony to real presence doctrine. It even implies transubstantiation if you, if you pick it apart, what he's saying there. And, um, you know, so it dawned on me that th this was the original teaching of Christianity, was that the Eucharist simply is the body of Jesus in a, in a real sense, not in the symbolic sense that I was accustomed to thinking in uh, Protestant circles. And then that it dawned on me that the Catholic Church had alone, among all these groups in American Christianity, had been faithful to this teaching over all these years. And if that was indeed the case, that the Eucharist was the body of Jesus, that was very important. And that, was, that, that, would, that would then be central to Christian experience and to lived Christian culture and, and practice. And so a whole lot of things fall from that. You also need a priesthood then. If it really becomes the body of Jesus, then you have to have an order of men to protect it, care for it, et cetera, lest it be profaned. You know, so that implies a, a priesthood. So all kinds of things follow from that. And, and that all was gelling in my head for about 36 hours and took, took basically a day and a half after reading that, that passage from Ignatius of Antioch. And I, I decided I really needed to become Catholic myself. And that was in the year 2000. Uh, I was received into the church in 2001, along with my wife, who was on a different kind of spiritual path that had a lot to do with the Rosary and the Blessed Mother. Uh, but we came in together um, in uh, South Bend, uh, Indiana. And uh, then uh, I, I eventually moved down to Steubenville around 2003 to work at the St. Paul Center, where I still work now, a vice president at the St. Paul Center. Uh, the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, but then uh, in the in uh, 2004 was hired by Franciscan University uh, to teach scripture, and uh, that's my my day job uh, ever since, uh, teaching scripture to uh, the 500 some theology majors that we have at Franciscan University. So that's a little bit uh, about me in a nutshell about my conversion. My conversion. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about that. I have a book, Stunned by Scripture. Uh, that goes into much greater depth about my own spiritual and intellectual journey into the Catholic faith. Um, I have uh, eight children, uh, five of whom are, are adults, but uh, they still hang around, especially when uh, around dinner time at the <laughs> house. Uh, and so they're, they're gradually, some are, some are getting married, so they'll be uh, more permanently moving out. But uh, yeah, large family that, uh, and I have some young kids as well, some elementary school age children still in the home. And uh, we live in Steubenville, right near the university. Oh, that's wonderful. So if, I, I'm guessing that St. Ignatius of Antioch is your confirmation saint then? Actually, St. Francis de Sales, he's the mm, patron okay. saint of converted Calvinists. So uh, <laughs> I think I think Dr. Hahn also has him as uh, his patron saint. So there's a lot of us that have come back from Calvinism. Oh, that's and, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, okay, let, let's dive right into kind of some of the meaty questions that I have for you. So the first one that I have is, you know, a great number of Christians, they, they seem to believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls and other ancient Jewish or even Christian texts, I mentioned the Apostolic Fathers, are unnecessary for studying the New Testament. Or, you know, they, they'll say something like, uh, but it's not scripture, right? And so we can't really use it to understand the Bible. As a scholar, how important are these documents to understanding the Bible? And if I can throw in too, how much is Christianity quote unquote indebted to ancient Judaism? Yeah, uh, those are great questions. Um, and they're huge questions. And in it, you know, it would take a book length, you know, response. And Jesus and the Dead Sea <laughs> like, Scrolls like this is one, kind right? of you know, the book, <laughs> book length response to what you just asked. So I obviously can't go into everything there. But um, okay, how important for the are the scrolls, for example, in uh, in other Jewish documents as well? I would throw in, say, the Mishnah, early collection of the Pharisaic tradition, mm -hmm. um, Josephus, an ancient Jewish historian who was a contemporary of Saint Paul. You know, how important are these things for understanding early Christianity? Because yeah, granted, they're not scripture. Okay, well, they're not scripture, but they do give us the context. what our Lord and the apostles meant to their original audience. And, and that's what we call the literal sense of scripture is, you know, what did it mean when, when the sacred author, you know, wrote this and proclaimed it uh, in his own time? And of course, there can be more meaning in there, 
but you always start when you're interpreting scripture from a literal sense. So we can misunderstand a lot of things. Let me give an example. For example, um, uh, a major a major misunderstanding about scripture that is at the heart of the Reformation is what does works of the law mean in the epistles of Paul? You know, it's a phrase used about a half a dozen times in Romans and Galatians, this phrase works of the law. Well, around the Reformation era, era you've got Luther who's basically understanding this idea of works of the law as basically any human effort. So he's developing a soteriology, a, a kind of a, a doctrine or a theory of salvation around the idea that uh, no human effort is necessary for salvation. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, uh, it's not only unnecessary, it can even be harmful because you would think that you're saving yourself. So an effort to grow in holiness becomes interpreted almost as a form of Pelagianism, that is to say, kind of a self-savior self uh, kind of uh, methodology. And, 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 then, and then the whole discussion about Paul's theology and so on gets skewed and run off on a wrong track for centuries thereafter because of misunderstanding of works law. Now, here's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come in. Dead Sea Scrolls are the only other ancient documents that use this phrase. And in, in one uh, scroll in particular, 4QMMT is what scholars call it. It's a Hebrew acronym for uh, on the works of the law uh, from the fourth Qumran cave. And it's a document that's a, it's a discussion between the Essenes and the Pharisees about how to properly observe the cleanliness rituals, essentially, of the Mosaic Covenant. And these, these ritual requirements and these very, very, uh, uh, very specific um, uh, religious practices, for example, whether, whether you can pour, um, whether you can pour water from a clean pitcher into an unclean cup, without contaminating the pitcher. You know, this is one of the things that's dis discussed in 4Q MMT. The Pharisees took the position that the uncleanliness stayed in the cup. The Essenes took the position that the uncleanliness travels backwards up the stream of liquid into your pitcher and, uh, and therefore contaminates your pitcher. You know, so these are, these are the things that are being discussed under the topic of works of the law. Other examples would be how to handle dogs, how to handle leather, how to handle uh, grain that's donated by Gentiles for sacrifice at the, the temple. So very, very specific cultic rituals all come under the topic of works of the law. And I think that's the starting point. You know, it's not, it's not the ending point. Like Paul says a lot. Paul, Paul goes off and develops a lot of theological ideas in Romans and Galatians. But when he talks about works of law, I think it's important to realize he's starting from a Jewish context in which works of law was things like circumcision, how to handle dogs, how to handle leather, how to handle corpse contamination, these kind of things. And Paul's saying that those ritual observances are not going to save you. Okay. Now he goes on and, and, and but you know, he eventually makes the point that no, no system of law can save you because your problem is that you need divine empowerment. Spirit. So no matter no law, no matter how perfect could save you, which is a valid point. And he develops off in that direction, but he starts from that Jewish context and I think if that had been realized in, uh, in the Reformation period, and, and remarkably, Thomas Aquinas suggests that understanding of works of the law in, in some of his works, like his commentary on Galatians, as the rituals or the ceremonial law that was part of the Mosaic Covenant. And I think Thomas was spot on on that issue. And, and if, if, if that had held the day, we wouldn't have had the Reformation, or at least it would have taken a different direction. So. I know that's a bit long-winded, but what I'm trying to say is the Dead Sea Scrolls and other Jewish documents really provide us this context for understanding where these discussions are coming from that we see reflected in the, in the New Testament epistles, and what are the cultural traditions going on in, in the Gospels. 
In the Gospels, for example, you know, Jesus tells Peter and John to go find a man carrying a jar of water and follow him back to the house to, to, make, uh, to prepare for the Last Supper. Well, what is that all about? Why would a guy be carrying a jar of water? That's women's work. Well, you know, we find out that the Essenes lived in celibate male community, and so they had to do their own uh, women's work. So that guy carrying the jar of water would have been an Essene. So mm -hmm. it helps us to flesh out the picture of what was really going on on the ground in AD 33 and understand kind of the, the historical and cultural background and many, many, many other examples. You know, what's the significance of Jesus spitting on, on the dust uh, and making clay to put on the man's eyes? You know, that's enlightened by the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I would say, you know, when, 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 you, when you try to read the New Testament without the benefit of these ancient Jewish documents, you, you end up in a, in a, um, a very weird uh, kind of very uh, pseudo modern understanding of Christianity, where frequently you will misinterpret what God's really trying to say through his scriptures and, and come up with deformed versions of Christianity, I would describe it. That's one thing. And, and then the other part of your question was, okay, how is Christianity indebted to ancient Judaism? And I, that's, I know, I know you think of it in a more nuanced form, because I've read some of your work. But you're, you're kind of intentionally asking that question, you know, from the perspective as what's common in American Christianity. Think of Judaism as one thing, Christianity as another thing. But, but when you see it covenantally, when you, when you look at the pattern of covenants and see that, you know, there's a covenant with Adam succeeded by a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Abraham, a covenant with Moses. Ultimately, the covenant with David is, is the climactic covenant of the Old Testament where eternal promises are given to the son of David. And that's where the New Testament picks up with the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, showing that Jesus is the heir to the promises of the Davidic covenant. He is the, uh, the son of David and therefore the proper king of Israel. And what was promised to David was to be king, not only over Israel, but also over the entire nations. Psalm 2 says, ask of me and I will make, make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. So the son of David was promised a, an international worldwide kingdom. And, and I've come to realize that that was fulfilled and that is the church. That is what the church is. The church is the international kingdom of David ruled over by the son of David. And so, you know, Judaism, Christianity, these are more modern terms that we come up with and that we place on the on these ancient phenomena but if you look at the sequence of covenants there's no disjunction there the prophets prophesied that the son of david would come and that he would restore the way we believe as christians that jesus is the son of david he did come in fulfillment of the prophecies and he established a supernatural kingdom of david uh, which has come to be called the ecclesia uh, which is like the congregation or, or the gathering uh, of, of people together and from which we get the word church, but, but we're living in the fulfillment of, of the prophetic promise of the Davidic kingdom. And uh, so there's like smooth continuity through all of that. And so thinking of that, like the, the Old Testament revelation stops and that's over with. And now we get this completely new religion from Jesus. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's anachronistic. It's, it's, it's decontextualized. It's ahistorical and it's wrong. <laughs> so we got it. We have to understand like an organic development. And in a lot of ways, that Essene community is like the, you know, the missing link um, because it, it, it helps to show the stages, you know, of, of, of God's working with his people. And a, a lot of the things that the Essenes had clued in on would then be taken up and, and moved forward in salvation history by, uh, by the church uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, you, what you said kind of reminded me of what occurred in my own conversion to Catholicism because, you know, so I was originally a Baptist and uh, you know, I had my Baptist traditions and beliefs. And when I started studying the early church, because I knew like how historians operate, you know, historians, uh, they try their best not to read their own traditions back into the past. They try to filter all of that and get, at, you know, on the ground, so to speak, with the historical sources. And then that constituted a test for my Baptist beliefs, for my traditions that I was holding. And uh, I started seeing like, yeah, right. they don't hold up 
if you do that kind of um, forward kind of perspective rather than reading back into the early church. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's incredible. Right. All the things that you said, I didn't, I didn't know that about the Essenes that they were, uh, I knew that some things about the Essenes and that like, you know, they're mentioned in the New Testament or excuse me, that the, they had some influence on the, you know, in the New Testament and so on and so forth. But I didn't know that they were a celibate male community. That sounds like a religious order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, essentially they were, you know, which, which uh, you know, again, you know, shows so some of the continuity um, because uh, they were already, you know, they were all, based on the writings of the prophets, they were already living this life of total purity, which involved uh, celibacy and just devotion to prayer and so on. And then later Christian monasticism kind of resurrects that, um, that spirit. But you see a lot of similarity between, you know, the Jewish monasticism of the Essenes and then later Christian monasticism. That's beautiful. And yeah. that kind of that kind of leads into uh, the next question, which is, you know, um, what what do the squirrels, as you say in your book, what do the squirrels have to say about baptism in the Eucharist? I mean, these are both yeah. huge topics that divide, you know, Christians today, baptism, and then what's going on with the Eucharist. So what, what do the squirrels say? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to start from the contemporary scene, you have all kinds of disagreement among Christians over the meaning of our central ritual, which is baptism or the, the, our, our ritual of initiation, you know, so you have many American groups and, and, and other Christians worldwide that regard baptism as primarily a, a profession of, of one's faith. It's like a, a public ritual that announces to the world that you have committed your life to Jesus. Um, that's, that's well and good, and it is that in a sense, uh, but it's so much more. As, a, as a Catholics, we'd say, no, the, the, you know, baptism is the beginning of your Christian spirit to you. So there's a transformation that takes place ontologically when you are baptized. You know, God actually works through that water to do something to you. Um, other Christians look at us and say, well, that, that sounds very superstitious, you know, mumbo jumbo magic ritual. You must've come up with that in the, in the uh, middle ages. And what's interesting, here's where the Essenes come in and the Dead Sea Scrolls, because you read the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and they too, the Essenes practiced uh, ritual washing for the cleansing of sin. And they did it on a daily basis and they did it uh, they, they developed the practice of this daily water washing based on uh, principles in the Mosaic Covenant and in the Pentateuch, and then also prophecies in Ezekiel and the other prophets about this unleashing of water and the Holy Spirit mm. in the age to come. So they believed that they were already living in the New Covenant era, and they believed that their water washing was a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, you know, the cleansing with pure water there, and uh, Isaiah 44 about uh, you know, uh, the, the unleash of water and the spirit upon God's people. And, uh, but, but when, again, when you read their, their description of their daily water washing, they talk about the Holy Spirit moving through the waters of the community and you can almost translate their word community as church. Uh, in some places, they do to use the Hebrew word for church for their community. And, and this, this water washing uh, communicates the Holy Spirit and it, it forgives sin when the person is properly disposed. So it's not like you can be hard-hearted and arrogant and just perform the ritual and then you're, you know, your sins will be forgiven. Anyway. But no. But provided you have the disposition of repentance and humility, and then you participate in the right, uh, then your sins will be forgiven. Now, I mean, th this compares very well with what St. Peter preaches in Acts uh, 2 at Pentecost about repenting and being baptized for the forgiveness of sin. So what we see then that is this notion that water can truly communicate to you the Holy Spirit, and can cleanse, can, can uh, affect the forgiveness of sins by the power of the Holy Spirit, together with this 
with the external ritual, okay? This is not a medieval superstition. This is something that pious Jews were already perceiving as the fulfillment of prophecy in the decades leading up to the ministry of our Lord. And then that provides the context then for, say, John 3, where Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, and, and he says to Nicodemus, you have to be born again of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus is lost by that, but he should not have been lost by it because you had the Essenes who were doing something very close to that. Now, you might say, well, was that valid baptism that the Essenes were practicing there? I say, no, I don't think it was valid baptism. I think they had gotten ahead of themselves. They, they, were, uh, they, were, they should have waited for the Messiah, you know, and they were waiting for the Messiah, but they were kind of anticipating and getting ahead of themselves in salvation history and doing things that they really weren't authorized to do yet that they should have been patient about. That may have been the cause for John the Baptist to leave their community and begin to preach his, in his own ministry. But uh, regardless, but but they were on the right track. They were thinking in the right direction, and they were they were correctly perceiving where the prophetic trajectory was going in terms of the new covenant era and, and what God was going to do with His people. So, uh, again, to recap, you know, the idea of sacramental realism that the the rituals of the sacraments can actually do something to a person's spiritual life that is not a medieval idea that is already present in pre-christian judaism that we clearly can see documented in the dead sea scrolls and then our lord endorses that takes it up purifies it you know and then establishes it in in uh in the church and and eucharist likewise the the uh the essene monks practiced a daily meal every day at noon of bread and wine. And if you try to reconstruct their theology of this meal, what you basically come up with is they regarded it as an anticipation or a foretaste of the Messianic banquet that they would celebrate with the Messiah uh, when he came. And you can see that if you, you want to get technical about that, uh, the, uh, this is described in the, uh, the rule of the congregation. 1QSB is what uh, is, is the scholarly jargon for this. But the rule of the congregation describes how they're going to celebrate this meal of bread and wine when the Messiah comes and shares it with them. And, uh, and, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, all the saints, as it were, the, the, the men of renown and, and of holiness will be gathered together to share the meal with, with the Messiah. So, uh, so you've got this meal of bread and wine that had to be consecrated by a priest uh, that was in, an, in, in anticipation of the coming of the son of David. Okay, now the Eucharist is much more than that, but it is that. You know, the Eucharist is at least a meal of bread and wine, which, you know, is more than just an anticipation. It's a participation in the Messianic banquet. Uh, with the Messiah who has come and who will return, okay? So they had a kind of Eucharist, and they began and ended it with, with uh, uh, psalms of thanksgiving, uh, that if you translated those into Greek, they would come out as Eucharist, uh, Eucharistic psalms, you know? Uh, they, they had a hymn book of, of hymns that they chanted, at, at their worship and, and, uh, and at the beginning, at the end of the sacred meal. And uh, all of those hymns are Thanksgiving Psalms. And they all began, I, I thank you, O Lord, for, you know, in Hebrew, which in Greek would be Eucharist o curie, you know, for, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so it really was a meal of thanksgiving, a meal of Eucharist that they practiced on a daily basis in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. So, you know, I obviously I find that absolutely fascinating that when I, I studied the scrolls professionally in, 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 in doctoral work and graduate work and so on, those kind of connections were rarely, if ever, pointed out. Uh, although they're undeniable, I mean, it's it's in the documents. You can you can defend it from the texts themselves and and show these similarities. But of course, you know, uh, nobody was really interested in showing the continuity between 
uh, the Second Temple Jew Jewish practice and of all things Catholicism, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that was totally not PC. So nobody did it, but I, but it's staring in your face. And I, one of the reasons I wrote the book is like this is, you know, this this stuff is is wonderful and it, it helps us to understand, you know, how the, the our our new covenant practice kind of develops organically and naturally out of the prophetic tradition and the scriptures of Israel and and even Jewish practice itself. Yeah, and really quick, I remember you mentioned in passing that John the Baptist was an Essene, and then he left the community. Uh, and that really, that really fascinated me because I, I at least know from you know people like Lee Barton McDonald and other scholars that Jesus does say or has certain sayings that the Essenes would themselves have said. Right. Um, I think when Jesus talks about like, the children of light or something like that, like that yeah. was something that you would hear from the Essenes. And uh, I know from historical Jesus research that people emphasize that they believe that John the Baptist had an incredible influence on the theology of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm interested in tracing that back to John the Baptist, right? So right. he he was once an Essene, is that what you're saying? And what was I the think evidence? So. In, yeah. in Luke 180, where it says that John was in the desert uh, until the day of his manifestation to Israel, in other words, until he began his public ministry, you know, it, it suggests that he spent his childhood and his formation in the desert, mm -hmm. which is kind of hard to understand how a kid is going to survive, <laughs> you know, out uh, in the, the, you know, area like portrayed behind me, because that's Qumran behind me. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but it, it actually makes sense in light of what Josephus says that the, the monks at Qumran uh, well, you know, Josephus doesn't identify Qumran specifically, but he does say that uh, the Essenes took in um, boys from the larger community of, of Judaism and, uh, and formed them. He even uses the term form like we use in, in Catholic circles of formation, mm -hmm. you know, but formed them in uh, their customs and manners. And, and that's basically how they got their vocations was, was by raising boys. And then presumably, uh, you know, the, the monastery that we've dug up on the shores of the Dead Sea was was a center where they would, uh, where, where these boys would go, you know, to get their education and uh, to be, to receive their formation. And so I, I, I strongly suspect that that's what happened with John. Either uh, Elizabeth and, and Zachariah sent him uh, there intentionally or being very elderly, Elizabeth and Zachariah uh, predeceased John and then his relatives not being able to raise him, you know, sent him to be raised by these guys. And, um, you know, Zachariah being a, 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 you know, we might think of him as a religious conservative mm -hmm. and a priest himself, uh, undoubtedly had sympathies with the kind of conservative religious uh, sacerdotal or, or priestly kind of spirituality that you see in the scrolls and reflected in the Essene movement, but there's a but there's a lot of other connections uh, between between John and um, uh, the Essenes, and so let me let me mention another one. Sure. Mm -hmm. This crazy diet. Okay, what does it mean? He's eating grasshoppers and honey. Okay, what's up with that? Well, Josephus actually describes another guy that that he himself, Josephus, apprenticed under. He was down in the same area, down in the Jordan Valley and was living on, on bark and grass. And so this is a guy named Bonus, and he was also practicing uh, frequent water washings. Um, when we look at the, and, and then you've got the, the uh, Essenes at their monastery at the north end of the Dead Sea, very close to where John was baptizing. They're washing in water every day, and uh, they've got you know, interesting things going on. But okay, Josephus tells us that when folk, when when men joined the monastery, they they had to swear a vow not to eat food prepared elsewhere for the rest of their life. Mm. That was important because the discipline in the community all had to do with rations. So if you offended in the community, you were disciplined by having your rations reduced. Of course, that's not effective if you can go elsewhere to eat. So in order for that to be effective, you had to swear an oath to subsist on what you got, which basically meant to submit, submit to the discipline of the community. Um, so what happened then when guys were kicked out? Well, Josephus says they, they had to eat grass or bark, and, and sometimes they almost starved. And, and sometimes the, the Essenes would be compassionate and, and take the guys back uh, to prevent them from starving. But that's what 
we see John students see him on the land. Apparently, you know, this, uh, we have to do some reconstruction here, but apparently, you know, eating off the land was unprepared food, and so it didn't violate the oath, you know, to not to eat food prepared elsewhere. You know, it was, it, maybe it didn't even qualify as food. Maybe it was just, you know, kind of like edible parts of the environment or something like that. So it, it did not violate uh, the oath. So it seems to me that John the Baptist was, was kicked out and there's any number of reasons why he may have been kicked out of the community. I suspect it was because of his desire to, uh, to preach to uh, a larger audience, to preach to the whole community and even to the Gentiles, which, which they forbade, you know, as a very insular community. Uh, and they, they actually prohibited the preaching to the, the to outsiders. You know, the saving doctrine was only for those who joined the community. John wants to proclaim it to the nations, which is what Isaiah says. Isaiah says that salvation will go out to the nations. John is very, very much influenced by the prophet Isaiah, as we can all see. He identifies himself with Isaiah 40, verse 3. Oh, that's another connection. Isaiah 43, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, that's John identifies himself as the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. The, the, the Essenes identified themselves as well with that. They cite that verse to explain essentially why they're in the wilderness, uh, which was that area, that dry area around the Dead Sea, that was the wilderness in, in Jewish culture. They cite that to, to explain why they had gone out into the wilderness to commit themselves to a life of prayer and holiness. It was to prepare the way of the Lord, which they uh, appear to understand as the Messiah there. So, so that's, that's too close a connection to merely be a coincidence. These, you know, John and the Essenes are the only two entities that are doing anything with Isaiah 40, verse 3. You know, Sadducees don't cite it. Pharisees don't cite it. The Samaritans don't cite it. They're not interested in that. But then you got two, two group, well, you know, a group and an individual that are both citing it as, as like their life verse, so to speak, like their, their identity is tied up with this verse. And so, I, yeah, again, my reconstruction, and, and again, this, you know, it's, I'm not dogmatic about this, but what seems to be to be the most historically plausible scenario is that John was sent by his early, his elderly parents to be, uh, to be educated in this center of learning uh, at the north end of the Dead Sea run by these Essene monks, and that he later had a falling out due to his understanding of Isaiah and his desire to preach more widely, was kicked out had to live off the land in order not to break his oath, but he carried out that mission of being the voice in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, a much broader ministry than that than, than they were willing to engage in. Yeah, and I'm sure like Elizabeth, you know, especially what we get, I think, from the Gospel of Luke, I think she always knew that her son was meant to prepare the way for the Messiah, and then she hears yes. about these Essenes, and she's probably like, John, I feel like this is where you're supposed to go, and then, you know, they send him. That's beautiful. Perfect. Wow. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so then, yeah, that kind of gets into my next question, which is um, something you mentioned earlier, uh, which is the priesthood, right? Okay, so you have the you have the Eucharist, you have, you know you have baptism, you have sacramental realism, uh, but where does the priesthood come in for the new covenant? I thought we did away with that, right? It isn't didn't Peter say everybody's a priest or a mediator, right? So you know what's going on there, <laughs> Doctor Bergsma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, priesthood is interesting because all through salvation history, you have uh, kind of a, a corporate priesthood of God's people, and then you have a ministerial priesthood. So this is already true at Sinai. So Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Moses says to the whole community of Israel, if you keep this covenant, you will be to me a royal priesthood. Hmm. Okay, so that meant, you know, the whole community had a kind of corporate royalty and a kind of corporate priesthood. But then even within that, there were young men traditionally understood to be the firstborn who were consecrated by the, the final plague, by the, by the Passover. You have this, this priest of the firstborn that assists Moses with, with offering sacrifice at the foot of Sinai and so on. And then later, the tribe of Levi takes over those firstborn responsibilities. It's very clear in numbers and so on. They count up the firstborn, count up the Levites, and make a, a modification for the difference in numbers. But then the Levites take over for the firstborn as a kind of ministerial, clerical, uh, a cast. So already in the Old Testament, you had kind of a general priesthood of every Israelite, 
and then a specifically like a liturgical role of liturgical service which we tend to you know, think of those as the priests proper. Now the Essenes had that as well. Um, everybody in the Essene movement had a kind of priestly spirituality and that's why they only wore linen, right? Uh, and that's why the guy, the, the young man wearing nothing but a linen cloth in, in Mark 14, 51 mm -hmm. and 52, undoubtedly an Essene, because that's how they, they, uh, they lived. They, they only wore linen, but they, they, they uh, practiced asceticism and so they'd, wear very little clothing and they would wear it till it wore out. Uh, but they only wore linen. And, and interestingly, they, uh, we find no wool at Qumran archeologically. It's just fascinating. I have a whole uh, peer reviewed article about you know, the, the um, uh, fabrics uh, from uh, Qumran and no wool at all. Uh, wool, uh, linen is very hard to make into thread. It's easier to make into fabric, but to make thread out of linen is very difficult. But the Essenes actually went through the, the effort to make linen thread. Everybody else just used wool thread to stitch their linen garments. But they would even make linen thread because they had nothing of wool because it's like this priestly purity. Despite that, within their priestly community, they also had a role of, they had an order of Kohanim, an order of, of priests who were the, the Zadokim, the descendants of Zadok. And, uh, and so you see that same kind of model of, of a priestly community, but then has specifically ministerial priests within it. And then over the whole community, you had a guy uh, who was called the Mabakr in Hebrew, which if you translate it into Greek, you, you're probably going to translate that as episkopos, and then into, into English, it's going to end up as a bishop. So, I mean, look at it. You, you got a, a, a priestly community, but that nonetheless has an order of priests that is kind of the leadership caste. And then over them all, you've got a guy who's an overseer. Uh, you know, was it just one guy or a group of guys? Who well, in each, each local community had one overseer, mm -hmm. one mabaker, and then under him were the zadokim, the sons of Zadok, kind of a priestly council or like a presbyterate, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there were even uh, Levites also, the, an order of Levites. And it's not clear were these biologically Levites or were these men who were kind of a supportive order of a secondary order of clergy like deacons, you know, who then were honorifically called Leviim in Hebrew, Levites, you know, and, and then you had kind of the lay Essenes uh, was, the, was the rest of the Yahad or the community. Mm -hmm. So you look at that and, you know, so you've got a three-tiered leadership system with one guy at the head, an overseer, and then a rank of priests and a, a, a rank of supportive clergy, we would think deacons, and then mm -hmm. you got laity. And this is this is the early church. And, and there's some folks that say, hey, a lot of uh, the early Christian leaders were previously Essenes, and they just naturally took this model over. But it, in, a, in a sense, it's the model from the old covenant. It's already there in Moses with the high priest, the priesthood, the Levites, and then the rest of Israel. So you've got that going on. And in terms of the priesthood in the, in, in the uh, New Testament, uh, most people don't recognize it uh, because they're not looking for it. But if you do start looking for it, you see that at different stages in his ministry, Jesus uh, hands over to the apostles certain prerogatives of the Old Testament priesthood. One of those was the interpretation of the law uh, that in later Judaism that came to be known as binding and loosing was the, what we call halakhic authority or the authority to interpret the law. Deuteronomy 17 clearly bestows that authority to interpret the law on the Levitical priests, the, uh, the hako, uh, hakohanim, halevaim in Hebrew and in Deuteronomy, a very distinct phrase from Deuteronomy, the Levitical priests. It doesn't occur uh, except in like Deuteronomy and, and, and later biblical inf literature influenced by Deuteronomy, the Levitical priests, and um, <clears throat> they were the one, the adjudicators of the, of the law. Well, in Matthew 8, 18, well, it's verse 16, the power to bind and loose is given to Peter, also to the apostles as a group in Matthew 18. That's a priestly prerogative to interpret the law that Jesus is giving to the apostles. Also, do this in remembrance of me. That's, that's very uh, cultic language there that Jesus is using. He's authorizing the apostles to offer the, the Todah sacrifice or the sacrifice of thanksgiving of the new covenant, which interestingly, 
excuse me, like in the Talmud, you, the, the rabbis say that in the age to come, the one remaining sacrifice will be the Thanksgiving sacrifice. It's the one sacrifice, according to Judaism, which will remain in the Messianic age. Mm, wow. So, and in fact, as Christians, we believe that's exactly what happened. So he gives them that power to, to sacrifice at the Last Supper. And then um, uh, yeah, at the end of John, we see him bestowing on them the power to forgive sins. And previously, the forgiveness of sins was mediated by the priests and the priestly ministry, according to Leviticus, especially Leviticus 5, which makes it very clear that if you needed your sins to be forgiven, you had to confess your sins to a priest, offer the proper sacrifice, and then through that priestly medi mediation, your sins were forgiven by God. But now that role is given over, that priestly role is given over to the apostles to, to make those adjudications. So again, if you if you know what to look for, you see how these priestly uh, um, responsibilities are given over to the apostles. And then in the book of Acts, we see the apostles sharing their authority with an order called presbyters, which is eventually where we get the term priest from. And, uh, and then you see that also in the epistles, uh, like especially the pastoral epistles, as Paul is delegating his apostolic authority to Timothy and to Titus. And then you move into the early, uh, to the, uh, early apostolic fathers, and it picks right up. In fact, arguably the first uh, post-apostolic Christian writing is First Clement. You know, there's a debate about its date but I go with those who say it was written in the 80s. And, and, and possibly the Gospel of John is not even written yet. And you've got First Clement being written. And First Clement is all about apostolic succession. Mm -hmm. so this is very much a pressing issue that the church had to get right from the get-go. And, uh, <coughs> and <coughs> Clement, who knew Paul, was a disciple of Paul and Peter, um, you know, explains the whole system that, you know, the apostles knew there was going to be dispute about the role of bishop, and so they appointed a, an orderly process of succession, etc. So, yeah, that, that kind of continuity. So, yeah, long-winded answer again. Sorry about that, but no, uh, mm -hmm. let me leave it there, and, and we can go where you want from there. Well, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to ask really quick, too. I mean, since you answered the question about binding and loosing, I'll swap it out for another one. Um, uh, a lot of A lot of Protestants will make the argument that the office of bishop and presbyter are really interchangeable, right? And so there is no kind of anticipation of a mono episcopal order in the church. And what you seem to be suggesting is that, well, no, the, the office of bishop and presbyter, there could be some overlap, but there was a real distinction between the two of them. And so I'm interested in how you would respond to that objection that, oh, really these offices are just all one and the same in the New Testament. And, um, you know, we, we don't see what comes later anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say that that the the monarchical episcopate is anticipated already in the structure, say, like the Essene communities. They were definitely set, set up that way with a mabak, one mabaker over each local community. And uh, I, I would, you know, I would concede a certain amount of the point in the New Testament writings that there are passages of the New Testament where it does seem that presbyteros and episkopos are just kind of used interchangeably. And there is, you know, there's a, some legitimate, you know, discussion about how exactly did this work. But it, it seems clear to me, at least, that the way this went was the apostles established, uh, you know, an order of presbyteroi, um, and sometimes episkopoi or overseer was used, you know, as an alternate term for the presbyteroi, but there was a clarification of terminology that took place very quickly between um, the uh, the apostolic writings, you know, the, between the New, the New Testament epistles and, and the time that you get to Ignatius of Antioch in right, 106. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Within those intervening decades, which wasn't very long, we're talking maybe 20 years, within a span of about 20 years, it seems like they began to reserve the term episkopos, overseer, for the senior presbyter in each uh, metropolitan area, for e each, each local city and its surrounding region. So that senior uh, presbyter 
was, was then the term Episcopos was reserved for him. And he was the overseer. And then you had the rest of the presbyteroi, the rest of the presbyters, and then you had the deacons as well. And, uh, and, and it, again, in, in Ignatius of Antioch, you, you see it lined up. And he calls, interestingly, he, he says the Episcopos, the, the Episcopos is in the place of God. Mm -hmm. And the presbyteroi are in place of the apostles. Yep. And so it's, it's like, a, an, a, like apostolic succession of the presbyterate. And that's interesting, too, because as late as St. Augustine, he, he still speaks that way. He talks about the succession of the, pre, of the presbyters uh, from the apostles. And that's one of the reasons that keeps St. Augustine in the Catholic Church. Like, why do I remain within the Catholic Church? Well, the succession of the presbyterate. You know, so that's interesting. And, and Peter calls himself, uh, you know, a presbyter in uh, 1 Peter 5. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, I, I would say that when in... The, the, the issue there is that, the, you know, the New Testament is written during the period of the active ministry of the apostles. And so in a sense, there isn't yet a distinction yet because you don't need someone to take the apostles place yet in that, that kind of oversight. And all the presbyters are kind of, you know, getting direction from the apostles. But with, with their decease at the end of the first century, then you know you have um, you know the the uh, the recognition of of the episcopate as particularly uh, succeeding to that role of leadership that uh, that the apostles had. Yeah, and let me let me ask you one question real quick, and then we'll move on into uh, the next question that I have, which is the Jewish roots of apostolic succession. But first, um, you know, some people say there's no example of a mana episcopate in the New Testament. But I remember I was reading a B.H. Streeter's book, The Primitive Church, and he explicitly believes that uh, James uh, the Just over mm -hmm. Jerusalem appears to be a mana episcopate, especially in Acts 15 when, you know, right. uh, Peter, you know, says, you know, uh, the Lord has chosen my mouth to be the one to open the church to the Gentiles. And then James reiterates Peter's ruling. And then he says, and therefore I rule. You know, he doesn't mention anybody else to mediate his ruling through. He right. just says, I rule. Or um, what is it in Galatians 2, when Paul talks about the emissaries of James that were sent to Antioch to confront Peter, uh, right. it seems as if James is the head honcho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and church tradition just is virtually unanimous in, thinking, in, in perceiving James as the first bishop of, uh, of Jerusalem. You know, and then the the other apostles going to other areas where they had sees. You know, so Ale, you know, well, Alexander, so should Mark. Okay, granted, Mark is not an, not an apostle, but mm -hmm. you, you get the the idea of the apostolic sees, and in particular Rome. Um, so you know, I think it's a, I think it's a good point. That particular question. That's you know, um, uh, I, I'm going to have to punt on that's okay. Some yeah. of the mm -hmm. some of those fine nuances because I'm I'm not. Uh, specifically like a New Testament historian. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what, um, yeah, I, I, I would say <laughs> it was inevitable that the structure of the church is going to fall into the pattern of the old covenant, which it fulfills, you know, high priest, priest, Levites, and, uh, and you see that pattern in, in the Essenes who believe that they were the new covenant community. Uh, they call themselves the Kahal. They talk about the uh, Barith Harash, the new covenant. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, you're, you're going to get that. So uh, from my perspective, I don't think there ever was kind of like a, some kind of, you know, Republican form of government mm -hmm. where, you know, all presbyters were equal and cast a vote. And, you know, I, I don't think that was ever the case. It, it just, it, uh, it's it's a matter of um, a growing awareness of something that's already present there. Yeah. Uh, but but I and I think this will be addressed too. I think in what you said, what was your next question, right? About the Jewish roots of apostolic succession. Yeah. 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 Jewish roots of apostolic succession. You know, Jewish culture thinks in terms of succession, right? Uh, every rabbi has a successor. You go back to the Old Testament roots. You know, every major institution in in ancient Israelite religion, which is a better way to describe it than say Judaism. Judaism is later, later development. The ancient Israelite religion based on Moses, you've got succession there. High priest is succeeded by typically his eldest son. Uh, king is likewise succeeded by typically his eldest son. 
you even have prophetic succession in the cases like Elijah, where he specifically anoints a successor. Um, <clears throat> Josephus talks about a succession of the prophets. Um, so, you know, you're always thinking in terms of, uh, of succession and, and institutions. You know, Jews don't have any problem with law. They don't have any problem with order. <laughs> they don't have any problem with succession. You know, these are all modern beefs that we have. You know, it comes out of, you know, democratic thought. It comes out of the Enlightenment. It comes out of uh, sometimes, you know, Marxist uh, thought. Um, we're the ones that have trouble with authority structures and institutions and so on. Okay, but but interestingly, what you see with Qumran, now, again, this, this is, uh, involves a certain kind of reconstruction, but sure. a widely accepted historical construct reconstruction of how the Qumran developed is that around the year 150, uh, the Maccabean king, Jonathan Aphis, muscled his way into the high priesthood and basically took it over by political power. And he shoved out the previous inhabitant of the office, whose name we don't know because we, we don't have any records of who was the sitting high priest at that time. Uh, but um, Jerome Murphy O'Connor, uh, Joseph Fitzmaier, many other scroll scholars, I believe Magen Broshi uh, and, and Yiga El Yadin also held to this. Uh, a lot of them believe that the, the mysterious teacher of righteousness referred to in the scrolls as essentially the re-founder of the Essene community. Um, from, from certain things that are said in, uh, in the Pesharim, which are these, these in, uh, commentaries on the prophets where they apply the prophetic uh, oracles to the history of their community. It seems like this teacher of righteousness was that high priest who was kicked out by a figure that the scrolls call the wicked priest, who is probably Jonathan Aphis, this Maccabean king. And then he went into internal exile uh, at, uh, at Qumran and uh, having prestige, having authority, and having a lot of knowledge and formation, he kind of gathered the Essene community together, kind of codified their theology, codified their practice, uh, organized them, and, and uh, because previously they, 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 there, was, there was confusion and a lack of clear leadership in their movement. Seem to have been, which may have been their the center of learning, you know, for the whole movement. Now, then, interestingly, after his demise, his place would have been taken by a mabaker, by an overseer, who continued that role of leadership that was originally held by someone who was a high priest. Okay. And then after that Mabaker died, another Mabaker was pointed in his place. So in the leadership of the Qumran community, then he, the, the Mabaker of Qumran was the successor of a priest, okay, of the high priest back in 150 who had refounded their community. So you have a kind of a priestly succession, a succession, you know, of succeeding to a high priest who had founded a community. So you already have you, you've got that model and then when you when you look at say matthew 16 or matthew 18 when the power to bind and loose is given to uh peter and to the other apostles as a group uh, it's very interesting if you read uh kohler kaufman's commentary on that passage in the classic 1906 jewish encyclopedia mm -hmm. Rabbi Kaufman says these passages show Jesus appointing the apostles as his successors. And he uses the term successor. Okay. So, you know, apostolic succession. And, and who is Jesus? He is the great high priest, you know, who had the power to bind and loose. And now he's giving it to his successors, you know. So the, these concepts uh, are, are there. And so I think that the, the, show us that large numbers of early Jewish Christians who had come out of Judaism 
and had been formed in Essenism, they were just primed to understand how this would work. It just made perfect sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we were right about a lot of things except the identity of the Messiah. Now that we understand that Jesus from Nazareth is Messiah, we just, you know, place, you know, all our formation around him and, and, uh, and it works, you know, he's the one to truly bring the new covenant to truly bestow the Holy Spirit through the waters and, you know, fulfills everything that we were anticipating. So I'm interested uh, cause you read my paper, uh, I, or it sounds like you read some parts of my paper on, um, yeah. on the papacy. And, uh, I do mention yeah. where, where I think apostolic succession came from, which was the practice of Semica or ordination, um, for the, the, the judges on the courts of Israel. And so I was wondering, like, do you, do you think, what do you think about that inference as well? I mean, I mean, it's not mutually exclusive. It can be a both and here, but. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I would say that, you know, it's, it's again, it's not mutually exclusive. It can be a both and uh, kind of thing. But, you know, what you're bringing up there is yet another example of, you know, this Jewish mentality of institutionality and succession. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, it's, this, it's not some kind of commune, you know, radical egalitarianism, you know, yeah. Jesus said the 12 <laughs> riding around in a Volkswagen van again and uh, tie dye <laughs> shirts and tell everybody to, you know, practice peace and, you know, this kind of thing. It, it, it's no problem. And, uh, you know, the scrolls also point this out, you know, everybody in the Essene community was conscious of what rank they held in the community. Mm. Um, and they had to sit by rank at uh, at meals, which helps us understand why, for example, at the meal of the Last Supper, uh, we, we see portrayed in the Gospels the apostles jockeying for these different places. But it's because of this institutional mindset of Judaism where everything is ordered, uh, you know who the leader is, there's provision made for a succession of leadership, uh, everybody's, you know, in, in their place. And... Uh, and we see language like that uh, also in the epistles where, you know, St. Paul says everything in the church should be done decently and in good order. Um, in the apostolic fathers, in Clement and in Ignatius, uh, they emphasize everyone keeping to the responsibilities of his position in the church. You know, so the, the deacons doing what pertains to deacons, the presbyters what pertains to presbyters, the lay people keeping to their station. So everybody, you know, um, observing uh, the role and the rank that that they have in the body of Christ, and uh, that's that's not novel. That's not being introduced by Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul's not institutionalizing something that was originally, you know, chaotic and uh, so, some kind of egalitarian movement. No, that's just the Jewish mindset which is being taken over uh, into early Christianity. Let me ask you one last question and then we can wrap it up. So you kind of answered this in the beginning by talking about, you know, sola fide and works of the law, but I'm interested on, you know, are there any other reformation kind of principles or beliefs that really do crumble under the um, introduction of second temple Judaism, the context of the scriptures themselves? Yeah. Well, I think that we've talked about a, a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, the, the symbol, the, this idea of, um, <laughs> okay, the later development, all right, is not sacramental realism, because okay. I, I think we could document that in pre-Christian Judaism. Um, the later development is this kind of symbolic understanding of everything, you know, everything's just symbol, the Last Supper is just a symbol, baptism is just a symbol, okay, so that kind of, that symbolic attitude, that denial of the of the efficacy of the sacraments and the realism of the sacraments, that's something that I think, if not crumbles, it's seriously damaged by bringing in the light of Second Temple Judaism uh, to, um, and the realistic way that, you know, Jews thought about their acts of worship and, and the sacred rites that they performed. Um, okay, and then, okay, works of the law, uh, indeed, uh, that, um, uh, I think that that whole understanding of, um, you know, salvation by faith alone is uh, seriously damaged. And then this, um, the, you know, kind of the radical 
uh, Reformation of, you know, egalitarian models of church, you know, kind of the Anabaptists and so on, denial of the need for office bearers. Um, that looks anachronistic mm -hmm. when brought back into the first century and the transition between Judaism and uh, the early church. Um, so, yeah. you know, all those aspects of Protestantism, you know, end up looking at, uh, like, uh, you know, later, later developments that are not really authentic to the organic transition between Second Temple Judaism and uh, early Christianity. So th those are those are some things that come off the top of my head. How about Sola uh, Scriptura? <laughs> yeah, you know, Sola Scriptura. Well, you know, you, you get in Second Thessalonians 2.15, you say you, you already have um, mm -hmm. Paul saying, look, hold fast to the traditions that, that we taught you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And the problem there, as you well know, uh, Suyan, is that um, in most of the um, uh, Protestant translations uh, um, that, are, that are available among evangelicals, uh, they do not translate the word tradition as tradition in the three places where it's used positively by St. Paul, mm. one, one in 2 Thessalonians and, and then uh, th there's a couple elsewhere. Uh, for example, in the New International Version, which uh, I was formed in when I was an evangelical Protestant, those positive references to the to Greek tradition, the Greek word is parodesis, mm -hmm. those, pro those positive references were translated as teaching, Right. Yeah. Whereas when Jesus goes after the tradition of the Pharisees, there they use the word tradition. <laughs> so that gives you this impression that there's no positive role, whatever, for tradition mm. in uh, in the New Covenant. And then in my own conversion, when when Michael Dauphiné, uh, you know, who eventually became my sponsor, when, when we got into this issue of tradition, and he's showing me these passages where Paul is speaking positively about holding fast to the traditions. And I'm looking at like, why didn't I ever see that before? And then I open up my Bible and I'm looking at, I've got teaching there. And yeah. like, what's going on? So I go to the Greek, cause I knew Greek. I'd got, got a degree in Greek uh, from as an undergrad, open up the Greek New Testament. Like it's the same word, it's parodesis. It's just the word for tradition. It's not really the word for teaching would be, which would be something you know, based on didasco or something like that, or a different uh, Greek word. Mm -hmm. um, and so why, you know, why do we have this? And it, it's really, I don't know if it was conscious, but at the very least, it was kind of a subconscious theological decision on the part of the translators not to kind of accurately represent uh, what, what Jesus is saying there. So, yeah. Well, well, Dr. Bergsma, I've had a great hour with you just talking about, uh, you know, Second Temple Judaism, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the context of scripture. Um, can, can you tell us, uh, for my audience at least, you know, where can they find more of your material in your work and, uh, you know, is there a way that they can support you in any way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my books and audio products are all available uh, at uh, catholicbibleteacher.com. That will redirect to johnbergsma.com, but it's hard to remember how to spell Bergsma, so just to remember catholicbibleteacher.com. Uh, it goes to uh, my website, which is hosted by Catholic Productions, and uh, they retail my books and they produce my audio materials. So I have a book, Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic, uh, that goes into this in, in much greater detail. I've got my uh, conversion story, Mass Conversion, How I Discovered the Catholic Church and the Eucharist. Uh, that's on CD and MP3. Um, and, and then just a lot of other, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a lot of other resources for understanding the Bible as uh, Catholics are available there. Um, I also blog uh, to a limited extent on uh, the sacredpage.com, uh, usually you know, giving commentary on the weekend readings. Um, and, uh, and, and also let me, uh, let me give a call out to the St. Paul Center. Um, I'm currently speaking to you from Wheeling, West Virginia. We, we're doing a priest conference here right now. I'm speaking in the mornings over a three-day conference. We're right in the middle of it. We've got 240 priests oh, yeah. from around the country and from uh, other countries as well uh, here um, listening to uh, Dr. Hahn, uh, Ralph Martin, um, uh, Father McConey from St. Louis, and uh, other great speakers. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing my my bit as well. Um, 
so the St. Paul Center, you could just Google them, St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Um, great organization. And um, a lot of my videos and uh, stuff are being produced now from the St. Paul Center. And, and they're also my primary publisher. I've got uh, commentaries on the, um, on the Sunday readings um, called the Word of the Lord series. So a volume on years A, B, C, and also a volume on the Solemnities and Feasts. So if people want to, the reflections of a Bible scholar on the lectionary readings for uh, the Lord's days and feast days through the year, uh, they can pick up these volumes. And uh, we're, we're really, really delighted that they're off the press now. Well, Dr. Bergsman, thank you so much. I've, I've had a great time talking to you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for reaching out. Hopefully we'll talk later too.